I myself am not a historian, but it's something that I um, certainly engage in passionately as an, as an amateur. And uh, I, I, I fancy myself as someone who takes this historical context, this fascinating and rich historical context of which we are all a part, and tries to bridge it to the activities and to the concerns and to the needs of uh, our, our, our people here in the 21st century. Um, as Jill mentioned, it's often difficult to sort of impose uh, modern sensibilities on, on historical events and perspectives, but uh, I do think that still, of course, you know, the, the, the discipline of history is intended so much to, to be learned from. And uh, it's my hope today that I'll offer some ideas on the, that build on the history that she offered and perhaps offer a vision for how we can take the best parts of our past and um, exercise them and, and explore them more fully in the future. Uh, as we, we've heard about so richly already this morning, on March 17th, 1842, the Prophet Joseph Smith formally organized the Female Relief Society of Nauvoo. In the first paragraph of the minutes that uh, Jill discussed from that organizational re meeting, we read about the society's twofold purpose, as Joseph Smith described it. She talked about the organization and the offices as, as they were set up. But I'd like to draw attention right now to the two purposes uh, that, that Joseph called out. First of all, that the sisters might, quote, look to the wants of the poor, searching after objects of charity and administering to their wants. In short, they were to, quote, relieve the poor. And the second council was to, quote, assist by correcting the morals and strengthening the virtues of the female community. In other words, to attend to the spiritual welfare of the sisters in their care, or in the prophet's words, to save souls. These phrases, relieve the poor and save souls, are probably familiar uh, to us because the twofold purpose of the Relief Society has been consistent since its very first days with evidence of women's active engagement in these purposes throughout the 19th century church. Uh, the, the, uh, the slogan, Charity Never Faileth, adopted in the early, early 20th century, uh, sort of came out of an understanding of these purposes and, and continues um, to some degree, which I will which I will qualify later uh, to, to inform and at least influence the Relief Society today. In the administration of wants, or the uh, relieve the poor section of the mandate, we can point to efforts like the establishment of the LDS hospital, the cooperative store, the silk manufacturing, the grain storage, as profound examples of how seriously our foremothers took this mandate to search for objects of charity, and as Jill said, be useful and um, purposeful and helpful. They were industrious in making their community better, not just for each other, but for anyone who might need of their assistance. Similar, similarly, we know that they look to the spiritual welfare of each other by offering uh, healing blessings to each other, speaking in tongues at gatherings, and even honoring the divine potential of woman by becoming actively engaged in the global fight for woman suffrage. Evidence exists in the early Relief Society minutes themselves to demonstrate how intently the woman took on this role of spiritual guardianship. And the um, example we heard about this morning, the voice of innocence and, and that, that discussion, I think, kind of underpins this, this, this theory that, that they took this calling very seriously. Um, in fact, Joseph may have thought that they took it a little too seriously because he reproved them in the minutes for being subject to overmuch zeal in their efforts to root out sin in their midst causing them to be, quote, rigid in a religious capacity. He urged a more merciful stance to those who took his second mandate of correcting morals and strengthening virtues too contractedly. In the October 2015 General Conference, so fast forwarding about 180 years, Elder D. Todd Christofferson offered a modern spin on these same prophetic mandates in his talk, Why the Church? For me, this was probably the most important talk of the last conference. Um, it was quickly overshadowed by the following talk, which introduced the concept of ponderizing. But for me, I, uh, I really wanted to dwell a little longer on this 
uh, talk of why the church. And so I've gone back to it several times since and, and really think it um, comes at a crucial time in our history to understand uh, the, the jobs that the church performs uh, in our lives and in the lives uh, and, and, and in the kingdom of God uh, collectively. Although speaking of the church generally and not just of Relief Society, Elder Christofferson outlined the jobs that out, Elder Christofferson's outline of the jobs that the church is set up to do closely mirrors the two roles that Joseph Smith outlined for the Relief Society. From his talk, listen to the descriptions of the church's two main responsibilities. He starts by saying, It is important to recognize that God's ultimate purpose is our progress. His desire is that we continue from grace to grace until we receive a fullness of all he can give. That requires more than simply being nice or feeling spiritual. It requires faith in Jesus Christ, repentance, baptism of water and of the Spirit, and enduring in faith to the end. One cannot fully achieve this in isolation, so a major reason the Lord has a church is to create a community of saints that will sustain one another in the straight and narrow path which leads to eternal life. He goes on to say, one of the greatest blessings of being part of the body of Christ, though it may not seem like a blessing in the moment, is being reproved in sin and error. We are prone to excuse and rationalize our faults, and sometimes we simply do not know where we should, should improve or how to do it. Without those who can reprove us betimes with sharpness when moved upon by the Holy Ghost, we might lack the courage to change and more perfectly follow the Master. Repentance is individual, but fellowship on that sometimes painful path is in the church." Close quote. It's interesting to me that this description sounds a lot like the Prophet Joseph's mandates. It's kind of an unpacking of that mandate to correct the morals and strengthen the virtues and attend to the spiritual welfare of the community, essentially to, to save souls. Elder Christofferson goes on to describe the second purpose of the church. He says, there is a second major reason the Savior works through a church, his church, and that is to achieve needful things that cannot be accomplished by individuals or smaller groups. One clear example is dealing with poverty. It is true that as individuals and families, we look after the physical needs of others, imparting to one another both temporally and spiritually according to their needs and wants. But together in the church, the ability to care for the poor and the needy is multiplied to meet the broader need. And hoped for self-reliance is made a reality for very many. If the Relief Society's mission and the church's mission overlap so neatly, how can the Relief Society set itself apart from the larger organization and find a unique identity and purpose for itself and its women? These are the kinds of questions I've been asking recently and which I'd like to challenge us to think about today. My favorite definition of the word authority comes from the book The Silent Sex by BYU political professor Chris Karpowitz. He defines authority, and this is authority with a small a in the sense of political caucuses in which he primar primarily studies, as the expectation of influence. You say something, you express an opinion or a desire, and you expect that the opinions or desires of others will change as a result. They might not necessarily change in your favor, but you can expect that what you say and stand for will have an impact in the, on the collective conversation. It seems clear from our historical understanding of our foremothers that they expected to have influence on their communities and on their brethren from the sheer list of projects and organizations and meetings they were involved in. Jill just explained to us the expectation of influence that some of our early foremothers had, but in journal entries I've recently read of Ruth May Fox's dating from 1894 to 1895, I was stunned um, by the testament that her writings are to the influence Mormon women expected to have at that time. And granted, Ruth May Fox was an exceptional example of an influential woman of her time, but her journal entries reveal the sheer number of causes and civic activities women of her time were engaged in, both inside and outside of the church. So in what arenas do Mormon women expect to have influence today? either within the church or outside. A survey of the talks from the most recent women's sessions of General Conference demonstrate that Mormon women expect to have influence in shaping the home life. They exercise authority in the arena of developing families. Lest this is in doubt, 
Listen to the names of the four talks given by our female leaders in the April 2015 women's session. The family is of God, the family is ordained of God, defenders of the family proclamation, and filling our homes with light and truth. That was a single session. I was recently uh, uh, speaking with Catherine Schertz, who is here today, uh, and learning very briefly about something that she's studying in great detail, which is uh, Leah Woodso's influence on her husband, John A. Woodso's, and her influence on his thinking about motherhood being a woman's institutional domain to complement uh, men's priesthood responsibilities. And ever since that time in which Leah Woodso was looking for an institutional parallel in which women could exercise additional um, authoritative expectation of influence, motherhood and families have been arenas in which Mormon women have felt comfortable exercising authority. If we want to assign this arena of influence to one of the Prophet Joseph's two directives for the women of the church, it feels like it could fit into the category of correcting morals and strengthening virtues. However, if this were the entire breadth of the divinely approved arena in which women can expect to have influence and exercise authority, I doubt Elder Russell M. Nelson would have felt the need to give a talk entitled, A Plea to My Sisters, in the, in the 2015 October General Conference. We wouldn't have the need for Elder Ballard to have written two separate books on the need for counseling with our councils and specifically addressing women in both of those books extensively on speaking up and having their influence expected to be heard. We wouldn't have felt, the, he, President Nelson wouldn't have felt the need to say, quote, we need your strength, your conversion, your conviction, your ability to lead, your wisdom, and your voices. If our women today truly expected to have influence, if they exercised authority, we would likely not need an apostle of the Lord to ask us to step up. But he did and something is missing. We are not getting something as women in the church today about what it means to expect our voices to be heard and to have influence. Joseph's reprimand about being contracted in our views could apply not just to the way women treat other women, but in the, way, in the limited way women claim the rights and opportunities that are already ours. Our authority is not supposed to stop at the walls of our homes, and that is doctrine. This observation leads me to the second mandate from the Prophet Joseph and from Elder Christofferson. To look to the wants of the poor and administer charity. How would we score ourselves as women and as a Relief Society institution on this charge today? This mandate very clearly directs us outside of our homes to those who are not already among us. From my experience, the Relief Society of today may do a fine job of administering to the wants of the poor in spirit as we try to be attuned to those who need love and attention. But I have seen very little institutional effort to answer the Relief Society namesake purpose, to administer not just to the widow and to the new mother, but to the poor. There is a special challenge that exists with this mandate because the church's own mission so closely aligns with that of the Relief Society. The larger church already has a massive effort in place to look to the wants of the poor, from Deseret Industries to LDS Charities to the humanitarian missionaries, mammoth and effective programs. But those programs have little to do specifically with the Relief Society, whose special purpose is to attend to the needs of the poor. How and when did this namesake purpose get folded into the larger organization of the church, becoming almost exclusively male in its administration? I don't know the history of that, and I should like to know, but our, for our purposes today, I feel comfortable saying that looking to the wants of the poor is no longer an area in which the Relief Society has institutional authority. We do not experience nor expect Relief Society-sponsored action on behalf of needy people outside of our community. We do not even expect the Relief Society to have influence over how our own welfare and humanitarian departments take care of the poor. We take casseroles and tie fleece blankets and do food drives and coat drives, but for the largest and oldest global women's organization, our authoritative ability to provide relief to the poor is woeful. What if this were to change? In my work, especially in the work of um, the, the, the book, Women at Church, um, I offer a number of grassroots uh, and local recommendations for how women can be more engaged in local church governance. 
I have often been asked, what is my ultimate vision? What is my end game uh, in, in the work that I do? And I have often, I have always um, hesitated to offer any sort of vision uh, with a greater interest in my work on moving forward the entire body of Christ, on focusing on moving us as a people. Maybe that's unity trumping um, uh, practicality or restorative doctrine, but for me, that I take that call to unity very seriously. We haven't never in our history had a time when we've become a reformed, conservative, or, or orthodox uh, people. Uh, we have a single, um, a single body, and it seems like that is our greatest strength as well as sometimes our, our, our greatest weakness. Um, but today, I'd like you to indulge me in a thought exercise as I put forward something that may uh, be a goal for the next era of Relief Society, certainly not an end game ultimately, but, certain, but maybe perhaps a, a step uh, in, in expanding the work that I've done on imagining a greater local governance. Um, this thought experiment imagines what it might look like for our institutional Relief Society and our women of the church broadly to claim institutional authority over their namesake mission. To do this in more than just name, let's imagine for a moment that the Relief Society takes over the administration of the church's welfare department. There is a woman already at the head of LDS Charities, so this isn't entirely an outlandish as it sounds, although she works under a professional calling and not an ecclesiastical one. But in my mind, women, the spiritual descendants of Eliza R. Snow, Martha Hughes Cannon, Emmeline Wells, have an ecclesiastical responsibility to administer the efforts, the funds, and the human capital now claimed by the welfare department. The government of the Relief Society, now in place, strengthened with similar tenures and benefits as members of the Quorums of the Seventy, and with the vast additional network of employed and volunteer men and women, would have primary responsibility for any church effort to relieve the poor. The connection with the global efforts to relieve the poor would allow local relief societies to evaluate and contribute to real needs beyond their own communities. It would also allow local relief societies to feel a connection with other women beyond their geographic congregations. Imagine, for instance, if the global relief society leadership emphasized addressing illiteracy in our relief efforts. Local relief societies around the globe could gen then join in that worldwide effort. It would be glorious to be bound together in love and productivity that gets outside of ourselves and brings us together as women in service to others. This is my vision. It's a vision. It's a vision of the Relief Society claiming authority for relieving the poor. It's a vision of women exercising the power to act in God's name, the power we already have to fulfill our divine mandate. It's a vision of women expecting to have influence beyond their own homes and feeling not only the institutional and divine permission, but the very command to speak up, to contribute, and to be heard. Importantly, this would allow women to save souls in a way that is separate and apart from the men's unique mandate. As holders of not only priesthood power, but also priesthood keys, men currently fulfill the mission of the church by administering saving ordinances. Claiming a different sphere of authority would mean women don't have to be given those same priesthood keys in order to do God's work here on earth and to be the means of someone's salvation. The temporal service and spiritual service could work hand in hand, allowing both men and women to fulfill the mission of the church, but in distinct ways that meet their unique divine mandates. Rather than doing what the men do, women could have a meaningful avenue of communal salvation that allows us to get outside of ourselves and our families, experience a worldwide sisterhood, and to be God's hands on earth. Some may argue that the Relief Society is much more engaged in global service than I credit here. Some may argue that women individually are more engaged in relieving the poor than I credit here. And I do not deny for a moment that Mormon women around the world are engaged in massive, organized efforts to relieve the poor. I have interviewed dozens of women for the Mormon Women Project over the past six years who have started nonprofits and NGOs because of the divine power they claim to make the world a better place for those in need. From women selling handmade goods out of their homes and sending the proceeds to micro-lending organizations, to the founders of large organizations like Rising Star Outreach and Days for Girls, Mormon women are absolutely relieving the poor. But I am seeking an institutional blossoming of the Relief Society, of our society, 
to give women a channeled avenue of authority that works hand in hand with men. We do not have this today, and we are feeling the effects of it dearly. I will leave us with the influence of one of my heroes, Emmeline B. Wells, who served as the fifth general president of the Relief Society starting in 1913. With a testimony that the Relief Society had been organized by revelation, President Wells and her counselors, Cl Clarissa S. Williams and Jelena L. Smith, were committed to preserving the principles on which the society had been founded. In October 1913, they said, quote, we do declare it our purpose to keep intact the original name and initial spirit and purpose of this great organization, holding fast to the inspired teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith when he revealed the plan by which women to be empowered through the calling of the priesthood, to be grouped into suitable organizations for the purpose of ministering to the sick, assisting the needy, comforting the aged, warning the unwary, and succoring the orphans. Let us too have a testimony that the Relief Society was organized by revelation as an arena in which women can exercise the authority needed to save souls and relieve the poor. Our authority does not need to be the same as men's, but it needs to be unearthed, revived, even resurrected. Thank you.